In Search of A Type I. I've given this talk the title In Search of A Type I because it really did require a search to uncover the association's early history. The Association Typographique Internationale, or A Type I, was founded in 1957. The driving force behind the creation of A Type I was Charles Peignot, managing director of De Berny et Peignot, one of the most important French uh, type foundries. This, incidentally, is the reason why the association's name is in French. The first official general meeting of A Type I took place in Lausanne, Switzerland, during an ex exhibition called Graphic 57. The list of people involved in that first meeting is a virtual who's who of the type world of the 1950s. Over the 62 years of A-Type-I's existence, we haven't always been very good at keeping records and preserving the association's institutional memory. Most of the records we have now are, have are now kept at the University of Reading, but those records don't go back past the 1970s and a little bit of the 1960s. And only some parts of them have been organized and cataloged. When the board of directors commissioned me last year to write a history of A-Type I, I had to see if I could find some documentation for those early years and try to talk to the relatively few people left whose memory goes back that far. My own involvement with A-Type I began in 1990 when I attended Type 90 in Oxford, my first type conference. So I have several decades of firsthand knowledge, but when A-Type I was born, I was barely seven years old. On the other hand, in subsequent years, I served on the board of directors for 14 years and as president for six. I have written quite a lot about typographic history, and I'm willing to talk to pretty much anyone while I'm doing research. So it may be that I was the right person to ask to write this history. I only wish we had begun this project 10 years ago, but I suppose everyone writing a history of a contemporary organization has a similar regret. There are many boxes and file cabinets of A-Type I records at the University of Reading. And right after the 2018 conference in Antwerp, I spent several days in Reading digging into those boxes. Some of them were well organized, some were not. My work was made easier because Ferdinand Ulrich had done some organizing and cataloging of the materials as part of his postgraduate research at Reading. So I had Ferdinand's very useful outline of what kinds of materials we had and where they were in the archive. And by following up on a couple of serendipitous leads, I discovered earlier collections of papers from both Charles Peignot and John Dreyfus, co-founders of A-Type I and the association's first and second presidents, respectively. These were not in Reading. Jumping back, this is some pictures of John Dreyfus. You can see that this is an extremely low resolution photo on the left, that's because all I had was a thumbnail. Uh, somebody must have the full-scale photograph somewhere, and I would love to have it to use in the real history. This is the kind of things that was in the, in the Reading archives. The Peignot lead, the Peignot lead came from Jean-Francois Porchez, who was a type I president from 2004 to 2007, and who organized the 1998 a type I conference in Lyon. I stopped over in Paris for a couple of days on my way from Antwerp to Reading. And over dinner, Jean-Francois told me he thought that Peignot had given his papers to the librairie Paul Jam, a highly respected rare book dealer. This antiquarian bookshop is located in a very old building in the heart of Paris, in the Saint-Germain-des-Prés quarter of the 6th arrondissement. The very next day, I visited the bookshop and met the director, Isabelle Jam, the granddaughter of the founder. She was very helpful, uh, but she told me that the Peño archives had been donated many years ago to the Bibliothèque Fournay, the city of Paris's specialist library for, among other things, the graphic arts, which is housed in an amazing uh, Renaissance building. Unfortunately, I had no time during my brief stopover to visit the Bibliothèque Fournay myself, but luckily, one of my American friends who lives in Paris, Alison Merrill, is an art historian and editor, and she was also a member of the Fournay. 
She was quite familiar with the library, she speaks French, and she was willing to go to the library and dig into the Peño archives. So I got permission from the board to commission Allison to do exactly that. It turned out that the Peño archive, or Le Fonds Peño in French, had an unusual condition attached to it. Only items that had been already been published could be photographed or scanned. Original documents could not, although they could be quoted. This meant that Allison had to copy out by hand any information that seemed relevant. A very tedious process. Not all of the Peño archive was concerned with A-type I, but among the papers were many records of early meetings when the association was first being planned and when it first got going the institutional memory that was missing from the archives in Reading. There wasn't much personal correspondence, unfortunately. But here's where the other unexpected lead comes in. One of the longtime A-type members that I got in touch with was the Swiss book designer and publisher, Erich Alp. Erich told me that John Dreyfus, the second president of A-type I, had donated four boxes of a type I related papers to the St. Bride Printing Library in London many years ago and recommended that I go find them. When I got to Reading, I told Jer Jerry Leading about this. Uh, I didn't have time to go to St. Bride's myself, but Jerry, of course, is very familiar with the library and said that he would visit it and see what he could find. A few weeks later, when he had a chance to do that, he discovered that the Dreyfus papers were indeed there but nobody had been aware of it. Apparently, the four boxes had somehow been put into storage with their labels to the wall, so that they appeared to be just four more unidentified boxes in an already overstuffed library. What Jerry found in those boxes was exactly what we had been looking for, not just official documents, but correspondence between John Dreyfus and other founding members of A-Type I, including, of course, his friend Charles Peignot. There are missing pieces and blank holes in the historical record. But between the Dreyfus papers and at St. Bride and the Peignot papers at the Fournay, we now have a fair amount of documentation describing how Etaipai got started. <coughs> the impetus behind the creation of Etaipai was the advent of photo typesetting, which Charles Peignot supported, but which he thought would make it much easier for competitors to copy each other's type designs. Of course, copying of designs goes back at least as early as, as the early 15th, 16th century, when the printers in Venice accused the printers in Lyon of copying their type designs, which they were doing. But it was a major feature of the type business in the first half of the 20th century, with each major foundry or type machine manufacturer rushing out new type designs that would echo the latest popular designs of their competitors. Sound familiar? In those days, type was either set by hand or cast on a mechanical typesetting system. Those systems were not mutually compatible. Each manufacturer made its own type that worked only on its own typesetting machines. Even if a foundry licensed one of its designs to a manufacturing company, like Linotype or Monotype, the design would have to be redrawn and engineered to work on their system. This was also true <coughs> excuse me, of the new photo typesetting machines. Peignot's goal was to have type design included in the system of international standards that was governed by the Hague Agreement of 1925 on industrial designs. A large part of A-Type I's early effort was devoted to achieving this goal, including participating in endless international standards meetings and trying to establish A-Type I as an expert voice on matters of type and typography. As it turned out, all of these efforts were for naught. The quest for international protection of type designs was a quixotic effort that, over the course of more than 60 years, has never fully achieved its goal. But that's a story for a later part of the A-Type I history project. What A-Type I did achieve through the efforts of Charles Peignot, John Dreyfus, Jan van Krimpen, G.W. Ovink, and many others, was to bring the leading figures of the typographic community together creating an international forum for discussion of type design and typography, which is where we are. When they started, they were thinking in terms of a European typographic union, uh, 
which quickly expanded to become an international typographic association, including the United States and Canada. I wonder what the founders would have made of A-Type I today, with our focus on education rather than industrial protection, and our expanded reach around the world. I like to think they would approve. <clears throat> so far, my research has been mostly about the earliest years of A-Type I's history, since those are the least known. But there are, here are a few highlights from later years. The 1967 A-Type I Congress at UNESCO in Paris was the first to be a real conference, not just a series of business meetings. As Matthew Carter recalls, over time, people realized that this single question, the protection of typefaces, was not really going to be enough of a reason for A-Type I to exist. So these annual conferences got more and more important in the life of A-Type I. They became more social and less industry-oriented. That was a novel idea at the time, to have a program of talks and so on. As far as I remember, all of them since then have had a program and some degree of talks. Uh, in 1973, the early efforts at type design protection culminated in the, universe, uh, the Vienna Congress, which was a general effort at revising international standards for the protection of industrial designs. A special agreement about type design uh, was, was reached, and hopes were high. When John Dreyfus concluded his term as president later that year, he did so with a feeling of mission accomplished. But that turned out to be premature. The agreement required at least five countries to ratify it. In the end, only two did. In addition to its conferences, ATIP I sponsored a series of working seminars between 1974 and 1992, each one focusing on a particular aspect of type or typography. As you know, a new series of working seminars has just been launched, beginning with the one in Colombo, Sri Lanka, earlier this year. The 1983 working seminar at Stanford University, The Computer and the Hand in Type and in Type Design, turned out to be a seminal event, focusing attention on the new possibilities uh, of digital typography. It was organized by Chuck Bigelow, who at the time was an associate professor of typography at Stanford University, and featured, among others, Hermann Zapf, John Dreyfus, Donald Knuth, and Jack Stelfiger. Type 90, the 1990 conference in Oxford, England, was A-Type-I's first event to be open to the wider community of visual design. It was organized by Roger Black, and it was a typographic extravaganza, presenting both the traditions of type and the effects of new digital typography. Sometimes it turned into a clash of cultures. I remember the shock with which some people reacted to Susanna Lichko's all-digital presentation with its rock music soundtrack in one of the hallowed halls of Oxford. It was shocking to the old guard. From that date on, ATIPI was more outwardly focused than it had been in its earlier years. In 2009, ATIPI held its first conference in Latin America, in Mexico City. In 2015, the first ATIPI conference in South America was held in Sao Paulo. The first ATIPI conference in Asia was held in Hong Kong in 2012. And now, here we are in Tokyo for our second Asian conference. We have just published a draft of the first part of my history of ATIPI on the ATIPI website. It just became live today. So you can go there and read it now. It's just a draft. It will be part of the first book in the ATIPI history series, which will be published in time for next year's conference in Paris, appropriately enough. I welcome comments and any new information from anyone who was involved in ATIPI's early years. I would be especially happy to hear from anyone who has usable images from those early years. What we have is pretty sparse, or as you saw, low, re <coughs> low resolution. Thank you for your attention. I hope this short talk has given you a bit of historical context. Thank you.